This is the video lecture covering Lesson 16 in Clayton Croy's A Primer to Biblical Greek. In this lesson, we will discover the forms for the aorist passive indicative and the future passive indicative. As we have done for the last several lectures, I want to start with, again, a review of the principal parts. Remember that principal parts are those basic forms of a verb from which all other forms can be made. In this lesson, we will be learning about the aorist passive indicative, which is the sixth principal part. It is the basis of the aorist passive and the future passive forms, which is to say that we are finally at the last of our principal parts. So here you will see the aorist passive indicative forms. Again, as I have done in past lectures, I've tried to color code it to point out those markers of the aorist passive. And so just to remind ourselves what the passive voice is, it is when the subject of a sentence has an action performed to it or on it, rather than performing the action itself. So eluthane, we would translate, I was loosened. Eluthes, you singular were loosened. Eluthe, he, she, or it was loosened. Eluthemen we were loosened, eluthete, y'all were loosened, eluthesan, they were loosened. And there is an aorist passive infinitive, luthenai, which we would just translate as, in most cases, simply to loosen or to be loosened. So with the aorist passive indicative forms up there, let's just add a few more notes about things to look for in the aorist passive indicative. First, you'll see that in these verbs there are two characteristic markers. The augment there at the beginning, the epsilon, and the suffix theta, eta. On to that suffix, we add personal endings. These personal endings are very similar to the active endings of secondary tense verbs. That is to say, the endings look similar to the imperfect active indicative or the aorist active indicative, but those other two characteristic markers, the augment and the theta eta, are what sort of uh, tell us clearly that we are in the aorist passive indicative. You'll notice as well that there is no connecting vowel. Um, the, the endings, those personal endings, are added right on to the theta, eta. And in the case of the third singular, you'll notice there is no definitive uh, personal ending, uh, marking it as the third singular. So if you see a verb with just the theta, eta at the end, you can be fairly confident that you have an aorist passive indicative, third singular. So the second form that we're going to learn is the future passive indicative, and this one is based broadly on the aorist passive indicative. So luthesomai, I will be loosened. Luthese, you singular will be loosened. Luthesetai, he, she, or it will be loosened. Luthesometha, we will be loosened. Luthesesthe, you all will be loosened, and luthesontai, they will be loosened. There is a future passive infinitive form, but it occurs so rarely in Greek, or at least in the Greek of the New Testament, that you don't need to worry about it. With these forms of the future passive indicative up, let's make a few more notes about the future passive indicative. You can see that it is built on the aorist stem. We've dropped the augment, but you'll see the, the theta eta is present in there. We have added a sigma to that theta eta of the aorist passive sub suffix. So the, the key markers for the future passive are that theta eta sigma, onto which we have added the personal endings. These are the primary middle endings, metha, este, untie, for example, in those plural forms, that we also have a connecting vowel. And so the theta eta distinguishes the future passive from the future middle, which we learned in an earlier lesson. Just a few more notes on the aorist and future passive. The first is to note that present deponent verbs, you know, those verbs that have active meetings, although they have middle passive endings, 
They can appear either as middle or passive or both in the aorist and future tenses. When both the middle or the passive occur, there is no significant difference in meaning in most cases. Please also note that the second aorist passives lack the theta in the suffix. They'll still have the augment, but they lack the theta. And unfortunately, there is no um, sort of general rule that a second aorist active will also have an, a second aorist passive form. Greek is unfortunately not consistent in this regard. And so for reference to some of the more common irregular aorist passive forms, see section 113 in the textbook as well as many of the vocabulary items listed for this lesson. Finally, let's get started with one of our practice and review exercises. This is number one from lesson 16. Hadulas apakrithe to anthropo apastelen pros se hypo tu kuriu mu ala uk elemsten estan oikan su. So as has been the case, we'd begin by bracketing off prepositions and genitive phrases. So we see, for example, pros se would be one prepositional phrase, and hypo tu kuriu mu would be another one. And then ace tan oikon su would be the final prepositional phrase to sort of bracket out for the time being. So that leaves us with hadulas apakrithe to anthropo apastelen ala uk elimsthen. Next, we will try to identify the verbs. In this case, our first verb is apakrithe. And you can see here I've tried to distinguish the different parts of this verb. Ap is from apo, the preposition that is attached to um, this verb. Uh, we have the epsilon there, which indicates the aorist tense. Kri, which is the rem the remainder of the verb stem, and then the, which is that uh, distinguishing uh, marker of the aorist passive. And so here we have an aorist passive indicative third singular from apokrinomai, and here we would translate it as a deponent. So although it has an aorist passive form, um, it has an active meaning. So we would translate those first three words as the slave answered. The next verb is apastelen. And again, I've broken, broken this down so that we see the op there at the beginning, which is the preposition apo. We see the augment there before the verb stem stal. Um, we have the eta and the nu. And so this is an example of a second aorist um, passive form. So the, the eta followed by the new ending indicates that we have a aorist passive indicative first singular from apostello. And the final uh, verb form actually is one of your vocabulary words. Elimsthen is uh, from Lombano. It's an aorist passive indicative first singular. And here I've already given you the subject of the first part of the sentence, hadulas. Um, the subject of the second part of the sentence, apastelen, is implied by the verb form, it's I. And, and that is also true of the third verb, elimsthen. And so from here we would, we would offer a translation, something like, the slave answered the person, I was sent to you by my Lord, but I was not received into your house. Just a few other items to point out with this one. Um, you notice that to anthropo is in the dative case, and we typically tra translate the dative case with two or four. And here this is uh, indicating the indirect object of the verb apokrithe. Um, the direct object in this example is implied. So what does the the slave answer? Well, presumably he gives an answer. Uh, that would be the direct object implied. And then who receives the answer? That is the man or the human being, to anthropo, making to anthropo the indirect object. Uh, pros se, remember pros plus the accusative means to, so we would, we would parse se as an accusative. And then hypo to kuriu, uh, 
hupo plus the genitive means uh, by, and so tu kuryu is in the genitive case because it follows hippo and uh, es tan oikon su, uh, tan oikon is in the accusative case because it follows um, the preposition es. And both mu and su are genitive and they are genitive because they are restricting the meaning of kuryu uh, on the one hand and oikon on the other. All right, that is the end of this lecture on lesson 16. Thank you for your attention.